Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives. The only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening. And now, enjoy the show. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. This is a story of something lost and never found again. A sad story. A strange story. But in no sense a warning. For certainly, no one of us listening could ever be caught up in such a set of circumstances. Or could we? How sure are any of us of our destiny? Tom, take it easy. I can't, Laura. You don't understand. Why not? Why can't I understand what possesses you? There's no way to explain. It's just the devil that rides my tail. Look out, Tom! You... Hold on tight! Remember, I love you. It's... It's better this way! Our mystery drama... The Ghostly Rival was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Will McKenzie. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Sinoff, the Sinus Medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. remnants of the car are now a dying sheet of flame. The bright oranges of the fire smeared and dulled by the black smoke as rescue crews work. The man, mercifully thrown clear of the raging flames, his fall broken by the thick underbrush, lies still and limp as the ambulance crew pick him up and carry him to the waiting ambulance. It takes off immediately and soon, within the city limits, the familiar whoop-whoop of warning clears the road in front of it. It strikes a note of doom to all who hear it. Then, suddenly, there is the muted quiet of the hospital. Take him straight to emergency. Yes, Doctor. Yeah. Superficial yeah. burns, yeah. possibly yeah. internal injuries, but yeah. the main diagnosis is he was bitten by a black widow spider. Yes, Doctor. Ah, Whoever's on duty can handle the surface stuff. Alert the neuro resident. Whoever's on the psych side for the rest. Can do, Dr. Peters. Did you sign him in? Yeah, I hear the papers. There was a woman with him. His wife, I guess. She got caught in the car and burned to a crisp. Oh, uh, his name is Cartwright. I guess kid glove treatment. He's one of them. We treat them all the same. Uh, that's a spirit, baby. <laughs> Just the same. His family and in-laws did build a wing for dear old Central Hospital. All right, I'll see you in the snake pit later. Dr. Peters? Hmm? Oh, yes, Dr. Mathias. Has you put in a call for me? Yes, doctor. I got an accident case. No sweat, minor contusions and burns, but there are complications. Involving a psychiatrist? Now, this one may involve half the staff. First off, the guy was apparently bitten by a black widow spider. What? How do you know? Now, he was conscious when we brought him in. Told us himself. He got thrown clear of the car. He was the lucky one. Oh, there was someone else with him? Uh, yes, Doctor. His wife totaled with the car. Oh, how awful. They hit the guy pretty hard. Although he wasn't all that with it when we brought him in. Because... Well, because apparently his wife was going to have a baby. Oh, how hard can you get hit? Uh, tell me... Uh, how bad is the spider bite? 
Well, that's kind of out of my backyard, but according to Doc Stearns in toxicology, there isn't much to do but wait and see. Mm, well, as I remember, <clears throat> it's seldom fatal, but it uh, takes a long time for the poison to attack the system. And the pain is excruciating, even when it does. Now, this poor guy's ready to flip his lid. I mean, he goes through the guardrail 200 feet into the valley, kills his wife, an unborn child, and turns up without a scratch. Yes, except the spider bite. Yeah, that. Well, what's that next to losing your wife, your kid, and maybe your future? You're not asking me, Dr. Peters. You're telling me. And that is my job to discover and to heal, if I can. Day, Mr. Cartwright. Well, what's your uh, specialty? If you're a doctor, uh... I am. I'm a psychiatrist. Oh, well, that's different. No, no, not really. Just another phase of medicine. I hope not. I mean, I hope enough different. I've been wanting to ask for someone like you. I've got to talk to someone who might possibly understand. Mm. Understanding, I can promise you absolutely. But, well, at least I listen well. The best I can ask for. No one will believe me. I am trapped as thoroughly as that horrible thing in the bottle I let escape. But I have to keep hoping that somehow I can find escape, too. Well, let's see if we uh, can't begin by making a start at it, at least. How open is your mind? Well, I don't know. It's uh, pretty open, I should hope. You know who I am. Uh, you were admitted to the hospital as uh, Thomas Cartwright III. That's who I appear to be. Have you ever heard of a Terry Connolly who is buried in the graveyard behind St. Stephen's and whose headstone reads, Born 429-51, died 816-73? Well, should I have? Yes. Because that's who I really am. <sighs> How do I answer that? Hey, you consider yourself already dead? Condemned. Why? Because I sold my soul. Oh, that's a rather a wild statement. You mean like, uh, like Dr. Faustus uh, to the devil? I mean like that. Oh, and I hope by all means you're going to tell me about it. You still think I'm Thomas Cartwright III? Well, to all intents and purposes, plus your uh, public identity and all the private contents of your wallet, and also your wife's identification, of course you are. I couldn't possibly be Terence Conley, could I? No, I don't even know him. And may I introduce myself? Uh, not my outward appearance, but what lives within the outer shell? Suppose I accept that claim. Can you prove it? Can you listen to a sort of complex story? You have the floor. Okay. Let's start it this way. You're looking right at me. Now, I'll even give you a better opportunity. I, uh, I really don't mm. think you should get out of bed. No, I'll, I'll get right back in. Now, I'm standing. How do I look? Oh, young man in his early 20s. A little bit overweight, uh, brown eyes, the dark brown hair, slightly receding, and uh, some evidence of dissipation. Height about uh, 5'10", is enough? It'll do. Two years ago, I had blue eyes and sun-bleached hair. I was 6 feet 1, 185, all muscle. Here, I'll show you. In my wallet is, yes, this, this was the last snapshot I ever had taken. Laura took it. You see? Mm. Well, this would be the Terry Connolly that you mentioned. Hmm? That's right. With a surfboard. A hobby? My life. That was at Makaha, the internationals. It was where I met Laura, and the first change in my life happened. You fell in love? <laughs> uh, you wouldn't think it to look at her, but she can hang ten with any surf cat. Only by her, it was just a sport for kicks. Not a way of life. Now, that shook me. I suddenly woke up to the fact that I was nothing better than a surf bum. Oh, well, so you gave up surfing? Not exactly. I came back to L.A. Laura's from here. Well, from Santa Barbara. 
And since we wanted to get married, I had to find something to do to make a living. There was this kid I knew. We'd surfed at a hundred beaches ever since we were in junior high. Only he'd busted up a leg pretty bad on a flip-out at Monterey. He had a little stake, so we opened a kind of surfboard rental shop. You know, with skin diving gear, other stuff, snorkels and all. And I went in with him, giving surfboard lessons on the side. It wasn't bad, but you couldn't make much. You know how rich Laura's family was. So, uh, she came up with a better idea. I don't know, Laura. I, I, I just don't know if I could go that route. Oh, don't get all uptight on me. It's only money. Yours, not mine. Ours, darling. Once we're married. I don't want to live off you. Now, that isn't the question. <laughs> I want you to live with me. And I, I also want to be supported in some ways near the style to which I am accustomed. <laughs> You're not going to be able to do that being a half-baked beach boy. Oh, thanks for the way you size me up. Oh, there's no big problem, Terry. Let's be practical. You got your college degree mm -hmm. and decided to take a year off because you wanted to prove there wasn't a wave that swept in on any shore you couldn't master. But you said yourself... After Spud got all busted up, you bought it. You want to be a doctor. Okay. You've had pre-med. You just go on using my dough, and when you get to be a rich orthopedist, I'll make you pay and pay and pay. I, 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 I don't know if I can cut it after being a dropout. You can cut anything you want to, Terry. What about your father? Well, I've been breaking him down bit by bit. He's not all that tough. <laughs> and and how about my rival, Mr. Flab-bellied Moneybags? Tom Cartwright? That isn't fair, Terry. He's, he's just very different from you. He sure is. Several million bucks worth. Family money. He didn't earn it the way you're going to. Oh, Terry. What? I love you. You're what I want. Your father will never buy it. I told you I've been working on him. I've even got this far. <laughs> You're invited to dinner this Friday to meet him. You mean so he can look me over? Well, that's fair enough, isn't it? Sure. If you were my daughter, I'd make damn well sure I got a good look at anything chasing you. That's good when you young fellow. I'll have to remember it to liven up one of our board meetings. Oh. <laughs> well, you can put the brandy and two glasses on the table, George. And, uh, Laura? Yes, Daddy? Uh, why don't we have coffee out in the solarium? There's still plenty of light to admire the view. All right, I'll have George set us up there. All right, now, uh, you go along, Superintendent, will you, dear? Mm hmm I think Terry and I have a couple words to exchange. Okay, Dad, mm -hmm. but you won't be long, will you? Oh, no. I'm the only lady for the gentleman to join. No, no, no time at all. Well, <clears throat> you'll have some brandy, Terry? Oh, I'm not much of a drinker, sir. How much? Beg pardon, sir? <laughs> well, you heard me. How much to what? To get out of my daughter's life, leave her alone. Marry the kind of man I think she should. Someone with plenty of money. Well, it should be one of the requirements. The one that you don't have. I've got a better one. She loves me. I don't know. Out of sight, out of mind. Now, how much, Mr. Beach Boy? You take your bedroll and go follow the waves instead of the most precious possession I have. How about a nickel? I don't understand you. Ah, it's obvious how cheap you consider me. I thought I'd just keep the price in line. <laughs> okay. I'll score you one for guts anyway. But it won't help you. I know who I want Laura to marry, and so does she, and that's the way it will turn out. You may be in for a very unpleasant surprise. Uh, I doubt it. I offered you money to get out of your own free will. And it'll probably cost me less to have you removed. If that's the way you want us. You've got to be kidding. I don't make jokes. And we put it quite simply, Beach Boy. If you don't bow out gracefully, I will make certain arrangements to have you, uh... Well, if you'll excuse the expression, rubbed out. I'll give you 24 hours to think it over. <laughs> Chairman of more boards than we have time to list. 
Inherited money and accrued money, position, power. The man who holds all the cards and who, in the long tradition of robber barons, never hesitates to use any lever to secure his ends. But murder? Even second-hand? Is that how Terry Connolly reached such an early grave? I'll return shortly with Act Two. For a moment, as though exhausted, the pale young man in the hospital bed has shut his eyes, leaning back against the pillows. Dr. Matthias, the psychiatrist, eyes him carefully and then speaks quietly. Perhaps, Mr. Cartwright, we should let you rest for a little while before you continue. Rest, doctor? I haven't known any rest since... Oh, since the, uh, the night you were telling me about? Yes. I didn't go out to the solarium to have coffee. With Mr. Blake's ultimatum facing me, I, I went straight for my old beat-up car and took off. I had to think, clear my mind. Best place for me to do that is riding a wave. So, I headed for the beach. I always keep my gear in the back of my bus. The nearest beach was old Deep Six. Unless you had an attack of the crazies, nobody rode the junk that came in there. Rocky bottom, narrow reefs on both sides, and a crisscross that really chopped up the rides. Well, that suited me just fine. I wanted to risk my neck. It might be the answer. I took a heavy board because the wind was high, paddled myself out over the breakers, and waited for the big one. And I saw a Hummer come. I waited. Then I raced to stay ahead of the crest. She broke pretty. And it happened. Kick back. A rip current broke her wide open. She collapsed on me, driving my board the Lord knows how high in the air and grinding me down and under, rolling and tumbling until I hit my head and went out like the light above me over the sea, under which I was buried. sand above the tide's edge. It was almost dark. Beside my head lay a dark green bottle washed up by the waves. And from it, a voice I heard. Or did I really hear it? Was it just some sounding in my half-conscious head? It seemed to be coming muffled from the bottle. You you're inside the bottle? Just kicking around the old Faust dream. Your freedom for mine. I said there were no conditions. Open this bottle and let me out. And I grant you whatever one wish you desire. Okay. You got it. It's only a dream. How? There is no way I can dig this cork out. Okay, 
scrooch up in the bottom, and look out for flying glass. Here goes! The moment the bottle broke, a great hairy black spider with a red hourglass mark on its belly burst from the sharded remains of the neck. For a moment, it teetered on its long, jointed, multiple legs. And then, a second transformation took place. Almost as though it had exploded, the spider flew up into a giant of a man with a bald head bristling dark blue from shaping and a body covered with tangled black hair. Dressed, conventionally enough, in blue jeans, just like I wear normally. Servant, sir. Who are you? I am whoever you want me to be. But that is of little importance for the moment. You kept your part of the bargain. Now, I keep mine. Ask anything you want of me. One request. No strings. Choose. All right. I'm too tired and chopped up to debate the point. You ask me what I want, I'll make it within reason. More wealth than the father of the girl I want to make my own. Enough more so that he cannot keep us apart. Granted, you've made your choice. <laughs> I had the feeling of having been asleep for a long time when I woke up. Without remembering why, I had this idea I should be hurting all over. But it wasn't like that. I felt like I was floating on a cloud. The bed, if it was a bed, didn't support me. I, I just sort of hovered in space by myself. I didn't want to open my eyes. I didn't want to come back to reality. This was too plush too out of this world. Very slowly, I opened my eyes. Good morning, sir. Would you like to breakfast or bathe first? Who are you? Oh, dear. Mr. Cartwright had a big party last night. I've got a headache, like someone hit me with a sandbag. That's right. You have a bruise on your forehead... Do you want ice? No. I... I just want to know where I am. At home. In your own bed. That's crazy. I don't feel that way. I don't belong here. Now you do. Huh? You made one request to be richer, richer than the father of the girl. Now you are. Wait a minute. My first question was right. Who are you? Ah, we met last night. You made a request. It has been granted. A few hours ago, it was recorded in the book that Thomas Cartwright III died of a sudden, massive, unexpected heart attack. At the same time, a young man whose main interest was surfing was the victim of a drowning accident on a nearby beach. Your body lies there among the debris of the tide. In this bed is the body of Tom Cartwright, miraculously recovered from a vascular and cardiac accident. And within the shell of the body, within its cocoon, not Tom, but Terry, lives on. A thus... I kept my promise. How can I be what I'm not? Who is to know the difference? Oh, to begin with, I never saw this Cartwright guy. Rise, master, and look at yourself in the dressing room mirror, or even the full-length glass, here, on the closet door. I don't think I want to look. Sooner or later. Better now, when we're alone. I'm on my feet. I... <laughs> Oh, Lord, everything has changed. Is that really me? That is what you asked to be, 
richer than the father of the girl you wished to own. But I didn't ask to be someone else. I don't even know the man. How can I take his place? Uh, let me arrange that, master. But you can't be with me every moment. Don't I have a business? Uh, uh, go to work? Most fortunately, you're now on vacation. Most of it you plan to spend on your boat. You have few social engagements, except, of course, tonight. Tonight? Yes. Tonight, you are dining with Mr. Sherman Blake and his daughter. I was ripped apart at the thought to sit at dinner again with Laura and her father. This time, a... What? What would you call me? A half-man or, or a double imposter? How could I carry it off? And yet I knew I couldn't refuse the invitation. Laura, I know it's not an easy evening, but uh, life must go on. Uh, George, I think some more wine. No, not for me, thanks. I'll skip it, too. Oh, dear me. Well, what can I say? The least, the better, Daddy. There, as you wish. A terrible accident. Yes, it was so wasteful to find you, man. Why would he take a chance as he did in that uh, riptide with uh, such a broken surf? Maybe you could answer that, Daddy. Me? When you shooed me out to set up coffee, what did you say to Terry? You touted him off. You made it impossible for him to even think we could ever be... <laughs> Excuse me, I've got... <laughs> I'm, uh... I'm sorry about that, Tom. Oh, nothing to be sorry about. I understand. You do? Yes, sir. With your permission, sir, I'd like to talk to Laura alone. Uh, well, yes, by all means. I uh, hope you can bring her back to her senses. Uh, you know you have my blessing. Yes, sir. I know. Why don't you leave me alone? Laura, please. Don't you even have one small speck of sensitivity in that mean, rotten little soul of yours? I only wanted to tell you something. There's nothing you can tell me that I want to hear. I'm just trying to explain oh, that. Shut I, I, I... Before I met Terry, you explained again and again that you were not what you seemed, a conceited, pawing slob who reached for any woman as though it was his divine right. But what I'm trying to say is that I'm not like that oh, anymore. Don't make me laugh. We've been down this route before, Tom, this... There's no way. Now that I've known what a real man can be, that you could ever turn me on. I... I wouldn't dream of trying now. I'm sorry, Laura. Except... I wish I could tell you how sorry I am about what happened to your Terry. Well, thank you. Oh, it doesn't even sound like you're... I wish I could believe it. You can. I'm not quite the heel you make me out to be. I may have been once, but not anymore. Now I'll leave you alone. I just wish... Wish what? Well, I just wish I could... I could comfort you some way. Well, I don't see how. Thank you for wanting to, Tom. Funny, but but all night since you came to dinner, there does seem to be something different about you. I, I don't know what or why. Because I have changed, Laura. Give me a chance to prove that. With time, I think you'll find I'm not the hopeless case you've written me off as. I had found out two things. The first, that Terry Conley was dead. The other, that I, or Terry, had given up his life for nothing. I went roaring home in my newly acquired Ferrari to face Aki, or whoever he was, with a new decision. I want to go back. I don't want the money or this flabby, jaded body. So sorry. It's not possible. One wish only, and that has been granted. But I didn't know I'd have to give up my life for it. Please. Allow me to point out, you still live. Only outward identity has changed. It's the same thing. As long as I seem to be Tom Cartwright, 
The girl I want and love won't look at me. Won't have anything to do with me. Patience, master. You will see. All will turn out right. It is written, you will be married. Now, I must leave. If you need me again, go to the sea and find the bottle again. Oriental's head, a great jagged streak of fire exploded and disappeared. I realized that I had not been talking with Aki, but with what? A minor demon. Or a devil himself. What did it matter? He had brought me to where I was. And where was that? Was I dead? Was I alive? For a moment, the pale, tortured young man in the hospital bed stops his story to shut his eyes as if against a wave of excruciating pain. The psychiatrist, listening to him, is tempted to react compassionately, but for the moment he waits. The pain may be less physical than mental. And the harrowing story is not yet ended. I'll return shortly with Act Three. The wave of pain, whether caused by the spider bite or some deeper echo from the soul, has passed. But the young man in the bed still lies with his eyes closed. The nurse coming into the room is quickly pantomimed to silence by the psychiatrist. She stops with the tray containing the hypodermic and the phial of morphine. Quietly, Dr. Matthias goes to her. Dr. Peters ordered a hypo for him, Dr. Matthias. Well, I don't think he needs it yet. Now, if it becomes necessary, I'll give it to him. Yes, doctor. Mr. Cartwright? Yes. Are you all right? Yes. Do you have any pain? <laughs> pain? Oh. I'll never be without it. I can give you a needle if you want. No. Oh. No. No drug will reach the pain that really haunts me. I... I want to finish my story. Yes, very well. Uh, let's continue. It was her father who dragged me back into the whole mess. He came to see me at my house, and he didn't mince words. Uh, you can't leave me hanging like this. I have a deadline to meet. Yes, I know. Well, are you coming in with me, or aren't you? I haven't made up my mind yet. Oh, good Lord, man, you can't put me off. I'm on the edge of the precipice. I foolishly overextended. I, I have no cash flow, and if the banks ever get wind of that, the whole thing would collapse like a house of cards. And how much is it you want to borrow? It's got to be a couple of million, at least. Now, we have been over this before. And the security. We, we've discussed that before, too. You mean Laura? Yes. Except that she happens to be a security that you can't deliver. That's where you're wrong. I have only to tell her the truth about my my business problems, and she, she would sac I mean, she would agree to marry you. A lamb to the slaughter. What would you say? Doesn't matter. All right, Sherman. Or perhaps I should say, Dad. <laughs> You've got a deal, Laura. For whatever you need, up to what I've got. You'll never regret this, son. <laughs> And so, you were married? Yes. Not quite two years ago. Ah, uh, so it was a bad marriage? No. No, not for the most of it. At the beginning, for the best part of the first year, it was uh, uneasy and difficult. But slowly, slowly things began to change. I wanted to tell Laura the truth, what really had happened. But how could I? She would have thought me absolutely mad, out of my skull. Then, as the months passed, I began to see it looked as though I'd never have to. I remember one night, after a party, going to bed. How many people do you suppose were at that party tonight? Hmm. I don't know. A couple of hundred, maybe. And how many men? <laughs> you think I count them? No, no, I'm serious, darling. Darling? 
That's what I said. Oh. Uh, men. Uh, I don't know. I guess when Stanton throws the ball, there are more men than dames. What's the difference? I just wanted to tell you something. No matter how many there were, I'd have taken my man over any guy there. Laura. Yes. That's the way it's gotten to be with me now. That was the beginning of our whole new relationship. At first, I basked in it, gloried in it, ate it up. And then? Yes, Mr. Cartwright. And then? And then another crazy thing was happening inside. Can you imagine a man being jealous of himself? I was two people in one body, both of whom loved the same woman. One was dead, except his soul lived on inside this body. Who was it Laura really loved? Me, Terry, the scatterbrain, the live-for-the-moment guy? Or Tom, the percentage man, the, the cool cat with the morals of one and a built-in gift for destruction? Is that what you tried to solve? That's what I had to solve. Because. Because? Because. So very soon after Laura and I had found each other, she became pregnant. Whose child had been created? Mine? I mean, Terry's? Or Tom's? I mulled over. I agonized over what the future held. And at last, I had to decide. I, I had to make some attempt to find out. But how can we? You know, we're only human. We can't foretell the future. I could. I remembered what the spirit had told me. To seek him, go to the sea. Again, it was late in the day. And again, it was old deep six. Beyond the surf, I waited for the way. I was king, invincible, hanging ten. Suddenly, before I could move back, the wave broke upon me. The wild cross whip snatched my board and threw it sky high, and I was ground down under the mad swirling of the breaking water below. I came to again, lying on the tide's edge, just as I had done so many months ago. I suddenly realized what a fool I was. You asked nothing from me for what I wanted. But what about my children? What did you imagine? The world on a silver plate without any return? But you promised it was not the old Dr. Faust's gag. Naturally. We progress. Things change. Your soul had no interest for me. <laughs> Only your offshoot, your children from here on and on and into time, as long as they shall live. That's the answer to everything. Why I came back ready to strangle the woman I loved so she could never bear a child that would foster the dynasty of the devil. But you didn't strangle her. No, because... When I got home, Laura was half out of her wits. She had found that a black spider with an hourglass shape on its belly had been weaving or spinning a web over the crib we had waiting in the nursery to receive our baby when it was born. Well, then what happened? I started to push aside the web, but it clung to me. And as I tried to brush it off, suddenly the spider was clinging to my wrist and I could feel its bite, sharp and penetrating. And I could hear a voice in my ear. Accepted that? Never. Never. I took Laura with me to the car. The excuse for our wild ride that I had to get to the hospital to get an antitoxin for the bite of the black widow. Take it easy, darling. I can't. You don't understand. I love you so. I don't understand. What obsession. There's no way to explain. It's just that 
The devil rides our tail. Hold, hold tight. And remember that I love you. This is the best way out. So, you remember. You know that Laura is... Uh... She's dead. Why not me? What was I saved for? Uh, it's a question that can't be answered. Oh, yes. I see now. It's all clear. You. What? In another form. The Antichrist. The enemy. I can do nothing else. But Mr. Kite, I can kill you! Uh, yes, I can! I mean, I, I want to help you! you. you. Okay. 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 I don't need any medicine for me to handle this. <laughs> It's an unusual case, only because of the uh, the violence involved. There's not much to say about it, Doctor Peters. Uh, except I'd like to try to understand it. <laughs> that would take volumes. A classic world of delusions. Everything? Hmm? It's very little missing. There was love broken off. There was a child that might have been born. There was a man already beyond the norm of society who thought he was doing the right thing in destroying himself, his wife, and uh, his unborn child. And we just write him off, Doctor? No, 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 no. We write no one off. We probe as much as we can. We try to resolve what we can. There are still cases beyond all our knowledge. And someday, someday, we may solve them. look to me for any answers. This is the story of what happened, or appeared to. I know no other way than to leave it at that, unless someone can tell me more than I can understand. I'll be back shortly. There isn't much to say about this particular tale, except that he who traffics with the devil must be prepared to pay the price. A sad and terrible price for all who are involved. Except John Sheldon Blake, who was really the most to blame. He was the only one to survive, since Tom Cartwright, or whoever he truly is, is long since committed to an institution. John Sheldon Blake is also committed to an institution, except that he remains free funny how the establishment has a habit of winning when come right down to it they are the ones who are really mad our cast included will mckenzie marion seldes robert dryden and earl hammond the entire production was under the direction of hyman brown and now a preview of our next tale saul three calling myra seven Soul 3, calling Myra 7. Come in, Myra 7. Myra 7 here. You may proceed, Soul 3. Okay, Alfred. Remember, three seconds before you answer. I know, I know. This is Earthling 4825D. Earth designation Alfred Lathrop. I request audience with His Excellency Algus... To J. Audience granted. Proceed. Your Excellency, I wish to place a nomination for enrollment in your service. The Earthling locally designated Carl Sims. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the Sinus Medicines, and Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I hope you enjoy this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. 